Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Myron Eagle. I, I work on this stuff uh, from the political uh, shoving and pushing and uh, inside the Beltway at the Head of Enterprise Institute. I'm always pleased to get out of that milieu and to deal with real issues um, like the ones on this uh, paleo climatology panel. It's a very great honor for me to introduce my friend whom I've learned so much from, uh, Dr. Willie Soon. He is the Chief Science Advisor at the Science and Public Policy Institute, uh, which is a, a rather new group uh, run by uh, Bob Ferguson in, in Washington that tries to actually bring uh, scientific expertise uh, to the very resistant uh, members of Congress. Uh, Willie uh, is an astrophysicist and geoscientist at the Solar, Stellar, and Planetary Sciences Division of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And I'm not going to go into his whole bio, but it's a very impressive one. And uh, Willie has done some very important work in, in the field of the, the solar contribution uh, to uh, our uh, Earth's climate over the years. And uh, I, I won a huge amount from him, and I would ask you to join me in welcoming Willie Sim. Thank you, Maren, and uh, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Southern Institute, for holding this uh, conference, and which I think is really important. And I'm uh, glad that uh, so many of these uh, courageous scientists is uh, really telling uh, what is on their mind, and then bring forth the best scientific evidence that we do have to try to show that indeed the concern of all these the rhetorical argument on global crisis caused by carbon dioxide is sort of a, sort of a beyond science. So good morning again. Uh, my name is Willie Sun, as introduced, and uh, I'm both a solar physicist and a climate scientist who has been working day and night for the past 17 to 18 years just to quantify the role of atmospheric carbon dioxide or CO2 in both the climate system and life as we know it. If there is one single message of my talk today, it is this. CO2 may be a secondary greenhouse gas, but it's, it is certainly not the cause, of course, for the weather and climate we experience. And it is most certainly not any air pollutant in any sense of the word. Instead, we know that CO2 nourishes plant growth and can almost be sure that the 380 parts per million of CO2 concentration in the free air today is far below the optimal level for the growth of plants, especially for food production purposes. Let me now summarize for you the three key scientific points that I will cover today, which in turn will allow me to firmly suggest that it is impossible for anyone to insist that CO2 is an air pollutant as the U.S. Supreme Court concluded around April 2nd of 2007, last year. So point number one, the repeated claim by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, and its scientists, that the atmospheric CO2 level has not changed substantially during the last two millennia after as the past 650,000 years can both be shown to be false. And point number two, the level of uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration are largely controlled by temperature and other biological and chemical factors rather than the other way around. This is of course very in very sharp contrast to the popular view that is uh, suggesting simply more CO2 just means more global warming. Such claim, of course, has been championed by the IPCC and our former Vice President Al Gore. And point number three, please remember, please remember this, there is no magical CO2 knock in the climate system that will provide a perfect climate for everyone, tuning it up or down. Instead, I will argue that the sun, which has no norm for micromanagement of uh, the United Nations or the Air Corps, <laughs> <laughs> it's a more significant driver 
for temperature change than CO2, especially in the Arctic and Greenland area. I must make this very special emphasis that no magical CO2 control map exists because there is a widespread and almost dangerous belief in the popular press that if you just stop emitting this uh, 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 carbon dioxide from fossil fuel, then almost everything bad about the weather and climate system will suddenly become better. Instead, our active decision to combat global warming by cutting CO2 uh, emission from fossil fuel will have virtually no effects on Let me now introduce you to the first bright star of my talk this morning, the Western Hemlock Tree. The point I make here is that in contrast to the impure or chemically altered air bubble records from the ice wall, it is the plant response that may provide us with a better, much better record on how atmospheric CO2 has changed over time. Okay. Consider in this chart what the study of changes in the stomata property of Western Hemlock tells us about how the atmospheric CO2 has changed over the past 2,000 years. The Western Hemlock record shows large variation with both ups and downs in the atmospheric CO2 content. In sharp contrast, this results very different from the popular view of the CO2 hot history painted by the data from ice hole, where CO2 is essentially flared for the first 1900 years of pre-industrial period, and then a very sharp rise in the 20th century. So from the Hemlock Stomata CO2 data itself, I would conclude that the popular view of the IPCC is questionable at least on two counts. Count number one, the suggestions that the current level of 380 parts per million has never been exceeded at least since the past 650,000 years is correct, since this cannot be confirmed even for the last 2,000 years. Count number two, and more importantly, the idea that CO2 cannot change substantially until the Industrial Revolution makes fossil fuel combustion a reality is hard to accept and probably wrong. In other words, natural forces can shuffle quite a bit of the <coughs> carbon between its land and ocean reservoir and the atmosphere over the past 2,000 years, as hinted by the Western Hamlock record. Here is now, here is now a quick proof on how even the CO2 from the burning of fossil fuel cannot simply increase indiscriminately, but that the amount and the actual rate of increase of the atmospheric CO2, shown here as a blue curve from the burning of fossil fuel, will be tightly controlled by how warm or cold the atmospheric or ocean surface temperature itself, shown as the red curve. This is why even pioneers like Professor, the late Professor Charles David Keeling despite being the 10th generation cousin of President George W. Bush, to the common lineage of John and Mary Prescott, so there's no conspiracy here. He <laughs> warning everyone that a decade ago, projecting, fu projecting future level of atmospheric CO2 is not as simple as by spying the fossil fuel emission alone. So now let's consider this famous, what I call, elbow CO2 chart showing a comparison between air temperature and carbon dioxide. Indeed, the former Vice President Al Gore has used this chart for almost 20 years now, as, first, as soon as the first result came out in 1987, to tell his audience that global warming is caused by a rapid increase in CO2. But now note that the CO2, which is the blue curve, is closely related to the air temperature the black curve shown here, over the past 650,000 years. But as I emphasize in the title of my chart, that the correct fact, and this is as concluded by the original authors of this ice core project, is that CO2 does not drive air temperature. But instead, it is the temperature change that are responsible for the varying level of atmospheric CO2. But what has our former vice president El Gore say exactly about this CO2 and temperature relationship. In his famous uh, book and movie, An Inconvenient Truth, 
he states that although the relationship is complicated, okay, that the bottom line is still that more CO2 simply means more global warming. Although Vice President Goh never really explained what that complication is, and we'll hear more about this in the next few graph, he's only very quick to try to suppress any scientific challenge to his claim by invoking consensus argument. Such statement indicates that he believes social and political influences can trump science. The facts, however, clearly refute the former vice president assertion. The ice core record clearly indicates that during the transitional period, when the climate emerged from an ice age to a warmer period, as shown in the fourth panel of this chart, the temperature always started to warm first by at least 600 to a few thousand years before the actual CO2 level started to respond. As Professor Bob Carter of James Cook University said, to accept Vice President Law kind of scientific argument is no different from insisting that lung cancer can cause secret smoking. <laughs> just remember that he's asking us to throw away the most holy principle of science, which is causality. Again, please do not take my word for it. There's no need. Just consider the very scientists that produce this ice core data. They make clear statement of how atmospheric CO2 varies naturally in direct response to the large temperature changes consistently for the last seven glacial termination times or between the last seven transitions between ice age and warm periods for the past 650,000 years. Next, I want to dispel another widely held belief and misconception about the role of atmospheric CO2. This is very important because the point I'm about to make is not obvious even to some climate experts. First, a very clear uh, important disclaimer. Despite a very strong and unpleasant accusation noted in this court from the Boston Globe, no one is trying to cover up deliberately or misrepresent the popular view of CO2 as an amplifier of global warming. It is simply the fact that the idea of CO2 as a major amplifier of the glacial interglacial warming transition or ice age to a warm period cycle does not work if you study the data and details. For those of you who are interested, I have just recently published a paper that uh, speaks more details about that particular point. So let us begin with this model simulation on how and why the very large and thick land-based ice sheets melted away the last, uh, from the last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago, shown in the lab panels here, to the early warm Holocene period 11,000 years ago, shown in the top right panel here. In this first simulation, <coughs> atmospheric CO2 concentration will held constant at the low level of 200 ppm parts per million between cold ice age and warm Holocene. The only variable that change is that the incoming solar radiation at high latitude of the northern hemisphere where increase, which increased significantly as a result of changes in the orbit of the Earth about the Sun during the early policy, 11,000 <coughs> years ago. So with stronger incoming solar radiation, most of the thick ice sheets over North America melted away, as seen on the top right panel here, and with significant thinning of the ice over over East Antarctica as well. Now, consider what happened to the ice sheet simulation of the early Holocene 11,000 years ago in a second experiment. Here, the incoming solar radiation is kept high as before, but now CO2, atmospheric CO2, is simultaneously increased by 80 parts per million to 280 parts per million at the early Holocene, as suggested by the ice core data we studied earlier. Comparing the very small difference between the top and the bottom uh, results shows that the incoming solar radiation is a far more important and decisive factor than atmospheric CO2 in explaining why most of the ice sheets during the last glacial maximum melted away. The very large increase in the atmospheric CO2 by 80 parts per million has had very little effect on changes in the global ice volume. Even for the temperature measure itself, the, the low fight by the CO2 can explain no more than 30% of the uh, glacial interglacial warming. So that's how uh, small the role 
properties of atmospheric CO2 is. For the final part of my talk, I want to focus now on the observed climate change over just the past 100 to 150 years. Here I offer evidence that CO2 is also not the dri prime driver of climate and climate variations, but instead, intrinsic changes in solar irradiance, as rooted in the magnetic field variations on the sun, are a more possible and realistic driver for climate change over the Arctic. <coughs> Consider next a rather important test of two different hypotheses on the observed Arctic temperature change, which I'll show in a minute. I focus on the Arctic region, since it has been called the canary in the coal mine when it relates to seeing or detecting the CO2 global warming signal, mainly because of the relatively large coverage of sea and land ice over the Arctic, the climatic response to increasing atmospheric CO2 is said to be extremely sensitive in the Arctic because of the ice albedo feedback so that even a tiny initial melting of ice can allow more incoming solar radiation to be absorbed, which in turn will strongly amplify that small initial warming. Of course, if you are paying any attention, you will note that the ice albedo feedback works equally well for any small initial warming, regardless of the cost. This includes changes first induced by variations in the sun's irradiance. Okay. That's enough of a hint already. Here is now the Arctic surface temperature record for the last four years, given by the blue dotted curve. And also shown is the CO2 history plotted as the red curve. Looking at such graph, some scientists from the like from those scientists from the IPCC have argued for a possible CO2 role in the Arctic warming seen over the most uh, recent 40 years, especially from 1960s or so. But if we extend now the record back to the full 130 years of recorded history available, how can the equally prominent warming of the Arctic temperature for the 1930s to 1950 be explained? Or how can one even explain the cooling tendencies between 1940s and the 1970s while the CO2 level is starting to rise rapidly? Now, the left panel show a competing hypothesis to the idea of Arctic warming by CO2, the estimated solar irradiance history of over the last 130 years. Clearly, solar irradiance can better explain not only the warming for the most recent 30 years, but also the cooling from 1940s to 1970s, as well as a very large warming uh, in the Arctic during the 1930s and 1950s, from the cooler period of 1890s to 1900. From this result, I conclude that the sun is a better predictor of Arctic air temperature than CO2 concentration. Here is now another way to test my sun climate hypothesis. The historical temperature data from two coastal Greenland sites for the past 120 years are plotted as dotted blue curve in both top and bottom panels. Again, the solar irradiant curve is drawn in red to show the solar temperature correlation is also strong for smaller areas like Greenland as well. But how do we know that the above relationship haven't occurred simply by chance? In other words, how do we know that we have not fallen into the same trap as the former Vice President Gore in assuming that correlation equals causation? And can physics really tell us that the sun is indeed a bigger contributor to changes in the air temperature than CO2? Consider now the correct way of comparing the role of atmospheric CO2 forcing and that of the sun's radiation on the Earth's temperature. In this chart, even the IPCC would agree that the sun's radiative forcing is a far more dominating factor for generating seasonal changes and therefore variations on even longer time scale of decades to centuries. But here, we must consider both the baseline and the baseline plus change boundary conditions as the inseparable entity of what I call the weather and climate continuum. In other words, one cannot just pick and choose by insisting on looking at the difference in radiative forcing, since one must know the key meteorological and climatic processes that determine the mean climate quality or the baseline first, before knowing how climate varies and changes. <coughs>
in this chart, the net, the net forcing by carbon dioxide is about 1.7 watt per meter squared. And indeed, it appears to be so much larger than the estimated net solar forcing of 0.2 watt per meter squared. But again, I note that it is not the difference, but the overall magnitude of the forcing that is important. The changes in the sun's forcing results from the difference of a baseline that is at least a factor of 10 greater than the overall forcing of CO2, which is the 341 versus the 32 watt per meter square. And also, please note that as a solar astrophysicist, I do not agree with the value for the sun's net relative forcing decided by IPCC. But for simplicity, allow me to use the IPCC figures as they also prove my point about the importance of the role of suns for weather and climate. To really see what I mean, let's consider a rough analogy. <laughs> if you know, really want to compare one watt per meter square of solar radiation to one watt per meter square of CO2 relative forcing, consider the effects of having Mr. William Refrigerator Perry of the NFL Chicago Bear teams from the mid-1980s here representing the Sun, <laughs> trying to tackle the New England uh, Patriots quarterback Tom Brady here as climate, and somebody asked me to change the slide to Eli Manning, I said, no way, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> and I contrast, note how ineffective it is for me, Willie Soon, representing CO2, the bad guy. <laughs> Even if I manage to gain 1.7 uh, pounds compared to the 0.2 pound gain by a uh, big particular in the area trying to push and force the climate system cool or warm so decisively while ignoring a factor as big as the sun or the William Refrigerator Perry. Before I really finish off, I thought I'd entertain all the curious minds in the audience with this one final chart. If indeed, as I have shown and argued that changing solar light output have a much stronger effect on the Earth climate on time scale of several decades to century, then what do we know about how the sun's magnetism is going to vary in the near and far future? This final chart is essentially a teaser of what the sunspot number may change 170 years into the future, or until year 2180, 80, 80 or so. But as a scientist, I must emphasize that this is only a statistical game one can play. I will be the last one on Earth to insist that future climatic changes will result solely from a changing solar irradiance or other solar activity related factors. But I think this one simple preview of the variable future of solar activity will be sufficient to give us a big hint that future change, uh, especially over the Arctic <coughs> and Greenland area, will not be controlled by changing atmospheric CO2 alone. Indeed, this has been that one very simple point of my talk about things that we do know. CO2 is not in charge of all things weather and climate, not during the past, not at the present, certainly not in the future. I do want to end with a real positive note using the reminder from the mathematician and philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. Actually, I chose uh, Whitehead's quote because he was incorrectly attributed as part of two culture, which we know as CP Snow. By guess who? By our former Vice President Al Gore in his December 2006 speech on the crisis of global warming at the American Geophysical Union when he gets some flags. <coughs> but let's just focus on Whitehead's insight rather than Vice President Gore's series of mistakes as abundantly documented in this conference, especially through the work of Christopher Mountain in the lecture Apocalypse Known. So I recommend everyone to view that. And in case you are still worrying about CO2 causing catastrophic global warming in the near or far future, Professor Whitehead reminds us that <coughs> it is the business of the future to be always dangerous, and it is among the merits of science that it equips the future for its duty. I hope that we can all agree that science has our most important <coughs> and reliable tool to rational decision making, must never yield to social and political bias. As some scientists who are supposed to start, supported to study CO2 global warming idea tend to discount natural causes of climate change. And that will be all for my talk. Thank you.